Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Davis and I'm a member of the ACE Cymru Wales Committee. I'm an Associate Director at Arab. Welcome to this ACE Insight webinar organised by ACE Wales on a virtual consultation. Today we have two uh, presenters in Geraint Jones and Ellis Blackmore, both from Arab. Both will present for about 15, 20 minutes each approximately, which will leave us enough time for questions and answers at the end. If you could send your questions on the chat, um, that'd be grateful. Chetna, do we have a housekeeping slide? Okay, I can't see it. Um, don't, don't worry if you miss anything. Um, this, rec this will be recorded and will be made available to you on the website the next few days. So if you want to listen again, then you can. Okay, first of all, we have Geraint Jones. Um, he's going to talk about how we delivered a, a public <coughs> exhibition, sorry, a local inquiry uh, on a major project in Wales um, using digital means, enabling the PLI to continue during the COVID pandemic. And that will be followed by Ellis, who will talk about um, the virtual engage, um, virtual consultation or exhibition platform that we've developed in Arab. So please, Geraint, over to you. Thanks, Gary, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Gary mentioned, so I'm going to touch on how um, we organised a public inquiry for the A40 Pembley Winter Redstone Cross Improvement Scheme in Pembrokeshire, in West Wales, um, and some of the challenges that we faced in um, developing the public inquiry. If we can go to the next slide, please and the next one again. Apologies if I'm uh, sort of teaching you something that you already know at this stage, but uh, for those who don't know, it's worth touching on um, what public inquiries are, why they're needed. So on highway schemes, public inquiries are triggered when uh, we receive statutory objections to a scheme. And they're important to um, uh, satisfy the public interest test. So when we um, have a compulsory, acquire land by compulsory purchase that has to be in a wider public interest. So um, we satisfy that test through a public inquiry, which enables objectors to and supporters of a highway scheme to present their evidence before an independent inspector and also enables objectors to test the evidence that uh, the team have developed to demonstrate that the scheme is in the wider public interest. If we can go to the next slide, please. Apologies for the poor quality of the image on the right, but it is um, sort of typical of um, how inquiries are, are run. So they're traditionally held in a public venue and they're not recorded or streamed. And I think the uh, image is also reflective of typically typically the audience that we receive at these uh, events, which tends to be low on numbers, even though we plan for high turnout. And uh, shall we say that the audience tends to lean towards the uh, older end of the uh, age scale as well. So demographics wise, it's uh, skewed um, that way. So if we can go to the next slide, there we are. So this the A40 Pembley Wind to Redstone Cross scheme itself was very program driven. So um, the reasons behind that were primarily that it has a significant proportion of EU funding. Um, and in order to use that funding, um, a large proportion of the scheme has to be, or a proportion of the scheme has to be complete by a certain date, which I think is the end of 2022. We've also got the Welsh Government elections in May, and that means that um, sort of a, a pre-election, what's called a PERDA period, starts on the 25th of this month, where ministers can't make any announcements. So um, we wanted the minister to make an announcement on the scheme before that date. So they're the main things, and also to take uh, advantage of the site clearance uh, ecology season. On top of that, we've also had COVID-19 thrown into the mix this year, which I won't uh, 
dwell on too much because I, I'm sure everybody knows the challenges we've all uh, faced this year due to um, COVID. If you go to the next slide then, there we are. So in terms of running an inquiry during November 2020, um, we considered a number of different options. So the first one was delaying altogether and not holding an inquiry, although that was quickly ruled out due to the programme driven nature of the scheme. A second option is to hold a traditional event, but that faced much the same challenges that um, we would have had in the no inquiry scenario. So that was also quickly ruled out. So we were driven really towards incorporating a digital solution, which um, was, as far as we're aware, the first inquiry in Wales to incorporate any form of digital solution. Um, and the options there were to host what uh, we've called a hybrid inquiry, which is um, hosted in a traditional venue, but live streamed over the web, or to host a totally digital inquiry over Microsoft Teams or, or similar software. If we can go to the next slide. So yeah, to throw into the mix, we I touched on um, COVID earlier. So in order to um, look at the option of the hybrid inquiry, to look at the venue and whether that was feasible with all the restrictions given two meter working space and so on. So we had to plan in advance um, to make sure that, that option was feasible. And we had to go through quite a, a rigorous um, site specific risk assessment as well to make sure that um, everybody within um, Arup, the Welsh Government and wider team were satisfied with our working procedures. If we can go to the next slide please. So in public inquiries we tend to have a lot of different uh, formats that we needed to take account of. Um, so the first one is a traditional broadcasting setup, which is effectively the inspector cross-examining um, the witness. Um, we also had to consider then the broadcasting of with a virtual witness. So in, in the middle left picture there, we've got a um, Welsh Government team member who is an expert witness at the inquiry being um, probed or examined by the um, inspector. We need to allow for uh, broadcasting whilst screen sharing as well, so having evidence documents to hand whilst broadcasting with the um, expert witnesses. And also we needed to consider round table discussions where on the far right picture there you can see the small inset on the bottom left um, where a few members of the project team are gathered round a round table to discuss plans and to be able to display those plans on the screen to show to a, a wider audience. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. So we settled on option three, which was the hybrid solution, um, mainly because we didn't want to take away from the the feel of an actual uh, inquiry and the, the pressures really that that brings. And so this is the solution. So we were based in the Queen's Hall in Narbeth for a week. We had the um, expert witness tables, the um, Welsh government's team on the on the right hand side in the top left picture there and the um, inspector located at at the top. In the top right image we can see the equipment that we had to set up in advance. So the event was live streamed over the web. The access was from the public inquiry website and people could 
view the inquiry proceedings through the website, through a portal that went to a, the, a YouTube page, a YouTube film effectively. Um, the bottom right image shows that in a bit more detail. So we did have to source a local company down in West Wales to set up our visual and audio equipment and to run the event on the day. Um, we also set up a test day about a week in advance to make sure that all the equipment was up and running and that we had no teething issues during the time. And the bottom left just shows um, sort of the, the setup for the witnesses really, which was a very small GoPro, GoPro camera or similar um, in front of the um, Welsh Government's Council and the witnesses and the inspector. We had microphones, which we technically we have in traditional setups as well. And that meant that during the day or during proceedings, we could interact as normal as we would in a public inquiry, interact direct with the inspector, um, and that the cameras would just broadcast the proceedings and that really we didn't know that there was a camera there because it was so um, small and inconspicuous. And then if you go to the next slide, and then for the, this demonstrates then what the viewer would have seen. Um, so this is an image from the video stream itself. So you can see the Welsh Government's witness in a little inset in the top right hand corner. You can see the main inquiry proceedings. All the audio was picked up by the microphones. And the room itself was very traditional with the screens broadcasting the the witness to to those in the room and as i touched on earlier we could share documents and plans on this as well so the the witness would still be uh, visible to the people watching the broadcast on the web the camera would pan um, very quickly to whoever was speaking so the camera would switch to between the witness, the inspector, or, or the Welsh Government's uh, council, depending on who was talking at the time. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Um, it's worth noting that um, this scheme was part of a, a wider set of A40 improvements. So we had had held a traditional public inquiry in March 2020, so we could sort of directly compare um, numbers and so on. Um, in the March 2020 inquiry, which was totally traditional, we had a handful of people during the day, which um, when compared to the um, viewing the procedures over the web, I think we had between 15 to 25 viewers constantly on the stream. Um, so the, the numbers were massively improved due to um, the wider accessibility, so to speak, of being able to log on, even those maybe in, in work would have been able to um, log on to view proceedings. So yeah, that's, that's the end of my section. I'll be happy to take questions at the end and I'll um, pass over to Ellis for the Virtual Engage section. Perfect, thanks Geraint. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, if you'd mind, stop sharing your screen. Perfect. Uh, right. Hopefully, you can see. Um, so I'm Ellis Blackmore. I'm a senior digital specialist, also working for Arup. I'm going to quickly show some examples of Arup Virtual Engage, which is our online virtual consultation. So the aim is that we create accessible and engaging interactive virtual spaces, which bring people together. This is something that we've been doing since around 2017. Um, we used it as a way to supplement face-to-face -face consultations. Obviously during COVID times, this has become more important where we can't have face-to-face -face consultations. Um, We've delivered many um, virtual engage consultations and we've had 100,000-ish viewers. So it's better if I show you a few examples live so you can get a real feel for it. 
So we develop consultation, virtual consultations, sometimes as part of statutory consultations, say for a highway scheme, which will be my first example, but also through any sort of aiding engagement. So engaging with communities, engaging with schools, any sort of activity or consultation that requires collaboration and the sharing of information. So this is a highways example for a recent scheme for the A417 missing link. It shows a good range of documents. So we have things like embedded videos. Um, if I pan round quickly, you'll see that like a standard face-to-face -face consultation, it's set up in a way that we show a lot of information about the scheme and it means it's completely interactive. We have the demographics can all be tailored for the scheme and for the, for the location it's set in. So if I go over here, some of them are static boards, so like you would have a consultation, information about the project. And then we've also got some interactive elements. So options to view 360 images of schemes um, that can be panned around and it can be play around, played around with by people who are attending. The aim is to provide all the information that you'd have in a, a real consultation, but in a way that's accessible through the web. So people who can't attend face to face, even if we ignore COVID, um, we get wider demographics. So if I show you here, all of our rooms our, are accessibility compliant, so they can all be accessed and navigated using a keyboard for people who can't use a mouse or would rather use a keyboard. Um, depending on the content of materials, they can be activated and they can be read out through voice control. So this is a highways example, but all of the rooms are tailored towards the needs of the client and the needs of the scheme. So if I just quickly show this example, I can jump to a smaller room. So in projects where there are say fewer materials or there isn't a need to have such a large room, we can create smaller spaces. So this is another one that's been tailored very specifically for the needs. You'll see this is it's not an infrastructure scheme. This is for nature based solutions based in Birmingham. So it's all branded. There's a lot of information. You'll see lots of little pop outs and pop up, pop up information. They've all got instructions about what these icons mean as well to help people if I close one of these this is one I really like so this is rather than being for a statutory consultation this is an example that is for engaging with schools and communities so you'll see it's not a um, animation of a room it's a real classroom so the aim is to work with children so all of these information provide learning experiences so they could help say education at home but also you can jump and you can be in any space. So we've got an outdoor information about ponds. And then you can also, oh, it's playing a, playing a video for me. I'll close that. It's playing sounds, so it's playing a video for me, which I didn't want. Um, if I jump back to here. So I mentioned accessibility. So they can all be controlled by keyboard, but they're all, accessible through mobile as well as tablets and desktop. So we found this really helps with engaging with a wider range of demographics. So we use, actually, I'll jump forward a bit. We use Google Analytics to obtain information that's GDR, GDPR compliant about who accesses the room, which can help tailor tailor the room and improve, improve access. So we get information about demographics. If they're a Google user and they have their age, we get visitor location. So it's aggregated to a, um, a local community. So there'd be a point for say the middle of Cardiff, but also how long people spend looking at the board, whether they come back. Um, something I didn't demonstrate because our consultation is closed, but we, there's an option for live chat. So when this consultation was live, there's a little button here that was live chat with agents. So you'll see we've got a little, got a little poster. Um, we had agents that were available at certain times of the day so that like you would in a face-to-face -face consultation, people that attended could have that conversation with the project team 
and they would targeted discussions say with the ecology team or the the highways engineers so they could still request additional information all of the material within this space is downloadable so you can open up a pdf save it and download it and we can also bring in additional information that would normally be printed out at a consultation so we've got a virtual a digital preliminary environmental information report which is interactive and it's easy for the stakeholders and the landowners to find the information they're looking for so i missed a slide a second so this is the main aim so i've covered things about our demographics this is out this is up this isn't up to date at the moment we've got more than 100,000 users and we do find that we get a really good range of demographics using things like marketing through social media we get some we get young attendance i say like under 20 under 25 we also get um a mix of locations so people that wouldn't travel 100 miles or 200 miles to a consultation can still attend um I've talked about the flexibility that it's all customizable. You can access it in your own home. And that was all I wanted to show. I'll stop sharing my stop sharing my screen a second. Yeah, thanks, Alice. I'll act, I'll act as a, a chair then, I guess, for questions. So I've got a few rolling in. Please keep them rolling in. Uh, first one is directed at Geraint. Um, did you have any issues of people who may have previously attended in person but weren't comfortable doing so over the internet, thinking particularly of the elderly? Yeah, so that played um, quite a, one of the key reasons really why we went for the hybrid solution rather than the digital only because um, as we were down there in the hall for the week, um, we did provide the option for people to attend in person um, if they so wished, but they had to request attendance in advance through the programme officer. So they would have been allowed in if they so wished. We, we didn't have any requests. Um, it's difficult to know whether COVID may have played a part in that because obviously people may have been a bit hesitant to um, come down because of COVID but the option was certainly there um, and I think the way that we did the hybrid event catered for all demographics really those who wanted to view the stream or those who wanted to attend in person. Yeah I think it's right going we did explore one option or the other didn't we? And ultimately, with our client, it was decided that a hybrid solution would provide uh, a better all round solution and also provide us with the option of going all digital should the uh, lockdown restrictions tighten. Uh, Absolutely. And had that, so we did have a plan B. So, should that have happened, we would have put, for example, the inspect or the Welsh government would have put the inspector in a hotel, for example and provide accommodation that way and all the facilities. And we had the, the platform ready to go uh, should that occur. Okay, another question. Um, do you think this sets a precedent for all public inquiries to reach a wider audience, combining live and digital formats? Uh, I think so, personally. Um, so I think, and Ellis touched on this in her presentation as well, it, it's, to cater for all demographics really that we have both the uh, digital and the um, in, in person format um, as the first question alluded to some people want to go down and sit there and some people just want to sit at home and view proceedings live so by having both um, formats running in parallel in sort of a hybrid inquiry I think that caters for everyone and drives up um, participation with with the events, which which can only, in my mind, be a good thing. Yeah, but based, based on my experience, it's not just the demographics are affected, it's the people's kind of work circumstances. 
So those that have um, worked to a certain time in the evening, those that have got maybe children at home and look after them, they're unable to get out to go to the, the live event. Um, they could easily let log on into this these systems and um, participate in that way. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, da, 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 da. I can definitely see the benefits over traditional forms of engagement in terms of reaching a far greater audience, duration, content, etc. But how do the costs compare to the traditional exhibitions, which can be ex expensive themselves? I think that's one for me. Was uh, it one for maybe it's one for both of us? Maybe a bit of both. Yeah, I'll go. For, I'll go first. Um, I think it can depend because. It depends on the scale so I think you have cost savings you will have cost savings because there'll be things like hiring halls people traveling um but then there is obviously a cost with the cost with developing it but it depends on the complexity and the requirements and the scale so some consultations have five bits of material and they're all pdfs or some consultations have 35 bits of material and three of them are videos and embedded websites um so yeah it completely depends on the purpose of the consultation really so if i maybe go for the um inquiry um section and this sort of maybe combines with the, the next question that i can see on the screen which is um are you able to give an indication of the costs um so for the inquiry um i think the hiring of the audiovisual team um ended up at around approximately £10,000. Um, but you do have cost savings to balance that out. So in a traditional format, you would have a backroom team going down with you to the event, which would build up uh, accommodation and food and drink um, expenses, other travel expenses and so on. Um, in our event, we didn't have that because the backroom team could stay at home, uh, which was, uh, you know, benefited from a COVID perspective as well because we had less people at risk. So there is a balance of costs there. Um, I might touch on what um, as well on, on wider um, benefits. So I think there was a scheme um, not long, that's not long been in the domain, I think at the Lower Thames Crossing, the DCO may have been withdrawn because of issues around consultation. So does, doesn't spending a bit more on consultations maybe improve things and prove that we are doing things correctly? Is it something that we should be looking at um, more? So it, I, I don't think the costs are um, over and above or un unreasonable, shall we say, for, for the benefits that we see from these events. I think that's okay. that's similar with the consultations where we've been doing them for, we've been doing virtual to supplement face-to-face -face consultations since 2017. And we run a face-to-face -face consultation and a digital consultation with the aim of improving engagement. So we've, we've only, we've had digital led consultations as a requirement of COVID but we have used them to supplement it to improve the scheme and our engagement with people. So that's the main, that's the main target really. Yeah, definitely agree with that. And it's supplementing the old school uh, village hall uh, scenario to increase a wider coverage um, yeah. and increase participation to hopefully achieve uh, better outcomes for all. Yeah. It also means the information is available now. So in a real, in a face-to-face -face consultation, it's those five days or however long it, 30 days, whereas the information can still be accessed now and downloaded. So th that's another benefit that isn't cost related, but it does in a way save costs because people don't then contact the project team to access information that they want. And that has costs associated with it as well. Okay, possibly one for Ellis. I doubt yeah. Geraint can answer this one. Uh, did the Google Analytics allow the team to establish what proportion of the virtual engaged content was viewed? And could this be used dynamically to focus the audience to certain areas? So I can give a couple of examples. So I've, I've obviously not worked on all of our virtual engaged schemes, but say, so I'm digitally on 
A417, which is why it's my primary example. Um, it depends how we're set up really and what the requirements are. So for that scheme, we had Google Analytics enabled on the room as a whole. And then we also had Google Analytics enabled on our digital PI report. So we could get statistics of, we had just over 2000 viewers for the room, but then I think we might have had roughly the same, but you, we, for the digital peer. But something that we are looking at is enabling that analysis across all materials to see if we need to say, tweak the room layout to improve engagement with important information. I landed on my button. Um, so it isn't something we've done on all schemes, but it is definitely something that we can do if there's a requirement for it. Uh, where are we next? So both Gear and Danellis. Now it's been used successfully. Would you look to continue this when COVID is behind us? And would it be in place of a long place of or alongside traditional face to face? So I think I might have partly touched on this. Is that it depends but again, it depends on the scheme. I know that for some projects and some clients there is a requirement to hold face to face if possible as part of the, the legal proceedings. And in which case we we would supplement it, we have been already. But I know that other things like our example with engagement with schools, that is a digital led tool and digital led system. So it's slightly different. But if we're talking traditional consultations, I see it being, I'm not the client, but I see it being alongside to improve engagement. I think I'd, uh agree 100 percent so um i think it should sit alongside just to as one of the other questions said you know to reach people who may not be um digitally as savvy shall we say um and some people just prefer having a face-to-face -face conversation so i think it should um sit alongside but in future i, I may be a bit biased but i think 100 percent we should be uh, carrying on with this for both consultations and and inquiries yeah i, I remember on the a14 in particular um we did consider the level of uh digital infrastructure that the the local community would have and we did exp have concerns about well did they have the uh, right infrastructure in that community and even if they did would they be able to use it for example or would they have the uh the hardware to operate it so that definitely um influence our decision to have a hybrid um, PLI, for example. And I some, sorry, I have something to add that's related to what you were just saying. Okay. So talking about people who have the infrastructure, I know that sometimes when our schemes are particularly rural, there's a concern about people say not having the internet supply or something at home. So I know for our consultations, for, for a few schemes, we've enabled the the site to be run without internet on a ipad or something and those ipads are put in a library so it doesn't so not having the technology or laptops or phones or whatever doesn't stop you from accessing the information because we put up posters in news agents that say you can access the information through an ipad in your library or in your community hall so it just reminded me what you were saying gary great Okay, um, another question. Did you stream the PI or the public inquiry site inspection, Geraint? Uh, no, we didn't. So um, because of COVID, um, the site inspection was done by the inspector on, on his own. They are traditionally um, so a, a company site visits, but in this instance, it was done on its own. But um, yeah, that's, that's something actually that, um, we, because the inspector had made that um, request in advance, it's something that we never really looked at, but could be something that could be looked at in, in future as a post stream in the site inspection. So that's something that could be uh, developed for future inquiries, maybe. Okay. Um, so if there's any more questions, please put them in the chat box uh, very soon. Um, are there any uh, other points that you two want to get across? Is there anything that maybe is important that has not been asked or we've missed to date? Not that I can think of on my side. Nothing from me either. I think maybe to touch on the feedback. So I think um, 
Welsh government, both Welsh government and um, PINs, I think, have had good feedback on um, how the inquiry was run. Um, so that hopefully will influence running these sorts of events for future future events as well. Yeah, there's a. Uh, I remember there's, there's some of the benefits to the system as well. Some some of our expert witnesses were considered vulnerable, for example, so they weren't able to participate in the village hall, but they were able to participate then using the online system that we developed and set up. Uh, that was very successful, and there was people in other parts of the country which uh, would find it difficult to uh, get to Pembrokeshire um, and also help them as well. So. All in all, it was a very good system to enable the inquiry to uh, continue, progress, uh, to enable the statutory process to continue and to protect the project program, um, which was very, very important to us and the client. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for all your questions. Um, I think I'll draw that now to a close. Um, so many thanks for listening. We hope you found this interesting. Thanks to Geraint and Ellis for a really interesting presentation. And thank you all for your time. Just a reminder that we've recorded this webinar and we'll send you a link shortly so you can refer back to it or forward colleagues and a copy of the presentation slides too. Thank you much and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.